within this uh, false elephant, if you will. So what are Postgres and Hadoop? Uh, they are free and open FOSS solutions for storing and managing big data. So the goals of both solutions, this is based on my interpretation, uh, would fall into uh, save PIFI. I pronounce it PIFI because uh, PiFi is something else uh, in the community. Um, so number one, uh, storage. Big data needs to have a place to exist and needs to continue to exist. Number two, access. Big data needs to be accessible when needed by designated individuals. Number three, versatility. Big data uh, comes in structured, semi-structured, and unstructured formats. All must be supported. Number four, extension capability and interoperability. Extensions, optional add-ons, and integrations with other solutions, which help to achieve the other goals, are formally supported. Number five, processing. Big data needs to be efficiently processed to facilitate storage, retrieval, and analysis. Number six, integrity. Big data needs to be correct. Number seven, fault tolerance. Even if a component in the system fails, the other goals are still met. And number eight, inclusion. All goals are achieved through inc inclusive means. So we can uh, sort of compare and contrast these solutions um, within other frameworks and theorems. For example, the CAP theorem states that when there is a network partition, so when we in introduce a P, um, the distributed data store has to choose between um, consistency, availability, and that partition tolerance. Um, so Hadoop has focused more on the uh, C and the P, the consistency and the partition tolerance, and Postgres is focused more on the AP, the availability and the consistency within the CAP theorem. Why is fault tolerance important for Postgres and Hadoop? Well, fault tolerance is important so that you don't lose access to your data or lose your data altogether. Building fault tolerance into systems ensures that they're reliable, available, and serviceable, RAS. The term RAS was originally coined by IBM and used to describe the robustness of their mainframe computers. However, system science has evolved the use of the term to apply to all systems, including software. Fault tolerance and data management. Fault tolerance is a concept used in many fields, but it is particularly important to data storage and information technology infrastructure. In this context, fault tolerance refers to the ability of a computer system or storage subsystem to suffer failures in component hardware or software parts, yet continue to function without a service interruption and without losing data or compromising safety. Um, so there's often some confusion between the concepts of high, availab uh, high availability and fault tolerance. Um, at the most basic level, high, high availability refers to systems that suffer minimal service interruptions, while systems with fault tolerance are designed never to experience service interruptions. So building on this, in practice, the difference can be quite small. Highly available systems often aim for the so-called five nines uptime, which equates to just a few minutes of downtime a year. However, the underlying principles between high, and high availability and fault tolerant are quite different. Um, fault tolerance systems are designed to detect faults and remediate the problem, perhaps by swapping in a redundant component without interruption, while highly available systems generally, generally use standard hardware and aim to restore service quickly after an outage has occurred. Um, I, I thought this was well stated by Paul Rubens. The reason why high availability is often considered acceptable instead of full fault tolerance usually comes down to cost. Building fault tolerance into a system can be more expensive than accepting that short outages may occur from time to time. Um, so some systems cannot be allowed to fail. So for example, I, I uh, work at a hospital and patient monitoring systems cannot be allowed to fail, um, as well mission critical systems, uh, banking systems, and surveillance and security systems really cannot be interrupted. What are faults? Um, so the ISO defines uh, a fault as an abnormal condition or defect at the component equipment or subsystem level, which may lead to a failure. In everyday language, the terms fault, failure, and error are used interchangeably, but in fault-tolerant computing parlance, these have distinct meanings. So I'll read some definitions here um, from the IEEE. I'm not going to go through all these, but I'm just going to focus on the definition for fault. So it does state that it is, it is a defect in the code that can be the cause of one or more failures. It is also a manifestation of an error in the software. So some examples of faults, there's lots of these, but we may have stuck at faults in the logic level. Uh, bit flip faults uh, can be caused by cosmic ray strikes. We can have uh, processor stop. 
Um, firmware updates not completing successfully, data items being corrupted in the disk image of the operating system, et cetera. So when categorizing faults, we can have temporary and permanent. We can also have hardware-based and software-based faults, as well as random and systematic. Uh, faults can be temporary or permanent in, in manifestation. However, the same fault may result in different effects depending on where and when it occurs. So as an example, a soft error in the code segment is a permanent error, while one in the data segment may be temporary. Faults may also affect different layers differently. So a permanent fault in the logic layer may manifest as a temporary fault at the architectural level if the functional unit in which it occurs is often unused. Only a, a small fraction of faults make it to the operator and user level. Some errors can be masked or overwritten. And if the fault is directly in the operating system or application layer, the user is likely to observe the faults, but the underlying layers may not be able to help in detection. In computing, fault tolerance is often broken down into hardware and software-based approaches. So for hardware-based, uh, those would really focus on the, the power supply, the RAM, the motherboard, the cables, um, other peripherals as well. Um, software-based approaches would focus on the set of instructions which are stored and run on the hardware, such as the OS, the programs and applications, the database management system, et cetera. Um, hardware and software-based approaches are quite different. So some approaches um, for the hardware would be repairs, updates, upgrades, and recycling. And some software-based approaches would be new releases, patches, and bug fi fixes. As well, um, it's important to mention that hardware exhibits both random and systematic faults. So random faults are usually caused by deterioration over time and defects during manufacturing, whereas systematic faults can be created in any stage of the system's life, including specification, design, manufacturer, et cetera, um, whereas software does not exhibit the random or wear out related failure behavior that we see in the hardware. Software faults are categorized as systematic faults, and these systematic faults are produced by human error during any stage of system development and operation. And there will always be faults. Computer scientists and engineers have responded to the challenge of designing complex systems with a variety of tools and techniques to reduce the number of faults in the systems they build. However, that is not enough. We need to build systems that will acknowledge the existence of faults as a fact of life and incorporate fault tolerant design into computer systems. So what is fault tolerance? Uh, there's lots of different definitions of fault tolerance. I just picked two here that I thought were, were quite good and straightforward. So uh, in, in NASA's fault management handbook, they described it as the ability to perform a function in the presence of any of a specified number of coincident independent failure causes of specified types. And data flare defined it as um, the ability of the system to work or operate even in the case of unfavorable conditions. And I did like these two definitions because they were quite broad and not necessarily specific to computing. So uh, fault tolerance as a concept is not specific to computing. I won't go through all of this, but uh, the ISO's definition is also quite broad and, and isn't necessarily specific to computing, even though it was found within a systems and software engineering uh, manual. So fun with terminology. Outside of the engineering and computer science literature, various terms are used to discuss the concept of fault tolerance in different systems. So I've listed a number of the commonly used ones here, particularly disaster management and recovery, uh, continuity, particularly business continuity. Those are, are really big ones in the literature. We also see terms like dependability, robustness, et cetera. And at the bottom, we see resiliency, and I'll be discussing that at the end of the presentation. So faults and failures. Faults can lead to failures, but do not always lead to failures. And this is true of all systems. For example, in cellular systems, a number of robust DNA damage response DDR pathways repair DNA damage and damage from replicating and causing observable problems in the organism. This system could be considered fault tolerant. In computing, a fault, a fault that occurs in one component of the system may not lead to a fault or failure in another component. For example, faults in hardware may not create noticeable impacts on the software components that the end user experiences, as we've uh, discussed previously. Faults are upstream causes of failures, and failures in one system can cause faults or failures in another. That's quite an important point. Therefore, even though faults do not always cause failures, failures are always caused by faults, and fault tolerant design is needed. So that's some fun with language there. So looking at the relationship between faults and failures, we do see that faults are the upstream causes of failures, but they don't always cause failures. They can domino into other faults, or they don't necessarily have to cause downstream faults or failures at all, and that's called uh, fault containment. 
So in fault tolerant design, the goal is to recognize, prevent or repair faults so that they do not lead to failures. The ability of maintaining functionality when portions of a system break down is referred to as graceful degradation. If a system is capable of continuing to provide full functionality despite a fault or failure, it is considered fail safe. It is if it is capable of continuing at a reduced functionality, it is considered fail soft. So those are some important uh, terms in the fault tolerance design literature. So again, fault tolerance is not specific to computing, it's multidisciplinary um, to all systems theory and analysis. Enhancing fault tolerance increases availability and reliability, which are desirable characteristics in any system. As a concept, it is also important in many other fields and I've listed um, multiple fields there. Um, so including human resources, environmental systems, aerospace systems, telecommunications, et cetera. Uh, similar strategies can be used to create fault tolerant design in different systems, such as fault modeling, recovery processes, feedback control, as well as identification and prevention of single points of failure and the implementation of redundancy. So those uh, techniques really can be applied uh, across the disciplines. For example, in day-to-day -day life, preventing single points of failure by applying redundancy could take the form of multiple alarm clocks. Faults are normally identified and defined in a way that is field specific. However, different dis disciplines can work together to enhance fault tolerance. This is important as failures and catastrophic events often affect multiple systems. So I've uh, put in the, some definitions here of availability and reliability. I'm not gonna go through all of those, but uh, that's mainly for reference, just to show that they are slightly different from one another, but uh, do um, come into play in terms of fault tolerance. And this was uh, a graphic that I found um, that I thought really exemplified both reactive and proactive fault tolerance approaches quite well and sort of uh, provided some useful categories for those. So jumping into fault tolerance in Postgres, just a little bit of background on Postgres. It is written in C and was originally developed in 1986 as a successor to Ingress, which was also um, an open source SQL relational database project. It is licensed under the Postgres SQL license, which is a free and open source license. Um, it was originally known as Postgres, but is now known as Postgres SQL. And it was the brainchild of Michael Stonebreaker, who was a computer scientist or a computer uh, science professor at Berkeley. In 1994, the project added support for SQL and shortly thereafter, the name Postgres SQL came about. It is considered an object relational database management system for structured, semi-structured and unstructured data. Um, although it's primarily a relational database, it also includes features such as table inheritance and function overloading that are more often associated with object databases. Therefore, uh, it, it is considered an object relational database management system. So for data storage and processing in Postgres, it, it does support 170 out of the 179 features for full core SQL 2016 compliance, in addition to a long list of optional features. Um, it is highly ACID compliant. I'm gonna go through the ACID uh, principles in the next slide. Um, but this basically means that data transactions are protected through the principles of automicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. All changes to data are performed as if they are a single operation and that guarantees validity, even when faced with errors, power failures, et cetera, which prevents data corruption. This really enhances uh, Postgres SQL's full tolerance. Postgres SQL is capable of effectively handling multiple tasks at the same time, which is a characteristic known as concurrency. It achieves this without relocks, thanks to its implementation of multi-version concurrency control, which allows multiple users to access data at the same time and manages concurrency efficiently, um, which basically means that in practice, the read operations don't block write operations and vice versa. Postgres SQL is ideal for ETL, OLTP, OLAP use cases, and its SQL compliance and query optimizer also make it useful for analytics and data management. So the ACID principles, automicity, consistency, isolation, durability, as they apply to Postgres. So uh, automicity ensures that results of a transaction are seen entirely or not at all within transactions, but a transaction need not appear uh, atomic it to itself. Postgres SQL is consistent and system defined consistency constraints are enforced on the results of transactions. Transactions are not affected by the behavior of concurrently running transactions, which shows isolation. And once a transaction commits, its results will not be lost regardless of subsequent failures. And this makes Postgres SQL durable. So there is some interesting literature on the replication history in Postgres. Um, at first, Postgres only concentrated in single node fault tolerance and recovery, which is mostly achieved by the uh, wall transaction log, which I'll discuss a little bit more later. Fault tolerance is handled partially by the MVCC, which I discussed, but that's mainly an optimization. 
right ahead logging was and still is the biggest fault tolerance method in Postgres SQL, basically just having wall files where you write everything and can recover in terms of failure by replacing them. This was enough for single node architectures and replication is considered to be the best solution for achieving fault tolerance with multiple nodes. Eventually it became clear that one server tolerance is not enough and more people demanded proper fault tolerance of the hardware and proper way of switching something um, in built in, in something to be built in in Postgres. This is when physical, then physical streaming replication came to life. So that's a little bit about the interesting uh, replication history. So some keys to fault tolerance in Postgres, it's, uh, it's again, based on the ACID principles. If a failure occurs that prevents a transaction from completing in Postgres, then none of the steps affect the database. Essentially, Postgres does not support dirty reads. In addition to the enhanced fault tolerance achieved through ACID compliance, all actions on the database are performed within transactions, protected by that tr transaction log, that WAL, that will perform automatic crash recovery in case of software failure. Um, this allows a user to complete a restore back to a specific starting point in the event of a fault or failure called point in time recovery. Postgres SQL allows physical and logical replication and has built in physical and logical replication solutions. Database replication in Postgres is supported natively. Physical streaming replication streams physical changes from one node to another using an internal protocol for sending those wall files. For example, when a row is inserted into a table, change records are generated for the insert as well as for all the index entries. By default, Postgres SQL implements asynchronous replication where data is streamed out whenever convenient for the server. However, this can result in data loss in the case of a fault or failure. Therefore, it's possible to ask Postgres to require one or more standbys to acknowledge replication of the data prior to commit, which is called synchronous replication. Synchronous replication guarantees that data is written to at least two nodes before the user or application is told that a transaction has committed. The user can select the commit mode of each transaction so that it is possible to have both synchronous and asynchronous commit transactions running concurrently. This is important as with synchronous replication, the replication delay will directly affect the elapsed time of transactions on the master. With asynchronous replication, the master may continue at full speed. Therefore, this option allows flexible trade-offs between performance and fault tolerance. The quorum commit feature further enhances fault tolerance as it can facilitate write to at least two nodes before the transaction is considered completed. When a transaction commits, the default behavior is to force that wall uh, record, that wall log, to disk. If a fault or failure is encountered and Postgres SQL crashes, the wall will be replayed, which returns the database to the point of the last committed transaction and ensures the durability of any database changes. Recovery starts from points in the wall known as checkpoints, which are known, um, which are known safe starting points for recovery. They can be either immediate or scheduled. The duration of crash recovery changes in the transaction log since the last checkpoint. Uh, Postgres has also introduced a notion of timelines. Um, I, I won't go through that too much, but that's quite interesting if you want to refer back to that. And PG Rewind is a tool for synchronizing a Postgres SQL cluster with another copy of the same cluster. Um, so that's also a very useful tool within Postgres. Databases may be optionally created with data block checksums to help diagnose hardware faults. So that can be very helpful in fault tolerance as well. Therefore, the key characteristics which support fault tolerance in Postgres are point in time recovery and write ahead logging, built in physical and logical replication methods, isolation levels and ACID features, checkpointing and crash recovery, and use of extensions such as PG Rewind. And using Petroni with Postgres. Petroni is a popular tool to maximize availability in Postgres SQL. It is a template for anyone to create their own customized high availability solution using Python for maximum accessibility um, and can use a distributed configuration store like Zookeeper, uh, Console, Kubernetes, et cetera. A list of tools that can be used to increase availability um, is, uh, is there. I've linked it on the, on the slides. So the key fault tolerance enhancements added in Postgres 13, which has recently been released, are the parallel vacuum for indexes, which speed up the vacuuming of indexes, which helps to clean up the database and ensure that you do not run out of space on disk or experience transaction wraparound, where the database wraps around back to one after two billion transactions and starts to overwrite transactions. Um, in inserts now can also trigger an auto vacuum. Previously, only updates or deletes could trigger an auto-vacuum. Auto the auto-vacuum me mechanism is important as it helps ensure you don't run out of disk space and also uh, prevents that transaction wraparound. P 
PG Verify Backup is a core utility that helps to verify that a physical backup is correct. So it verifies the checksums. Um, and PG Base Backup is integratable if it is needed for restore and recovery. The wall append only logging um, facilitates streaming replication and helps to prevent the primary from running out of disk space. Um, and uh, and uh, the slot will not get dropped by the wall logs after it gets flushed. Uh, wall receivers can use temporary replication slot. Wall can use a temporary replication slot on a replica until reconfiguration can be completed. This prevents a replica from falling out of sync. As well, streaming replication can be reconfigured with a reload. A replica can be reconfigured with a reload instead of a restart. This reduces the total number of restarts necessary. Um, a wall recovery can continue if there are invalid pages. Wall will continue to replay and does not abort, which will get the database back to a valid state. That can, uh, this can then allow you to use the diagnostic and introspection tools to determine the root cause. And PG Rewind can now configure standbys. So PG Rewind is a core utility which can rewind or fast forward the wall and can now inject the configuration to bring a standby back up. So that was another important enhancement. So jumping into Hadoop, um, a little bit of background here. Hadoop is written in Java and was initially released in 2006. It is licensed under the Apache 2.0 license, and which is also a free and open source license. It is a collection of open source software utilities that facilitate using a network of many computers to solve problems involving massive amounts of data and computation. This is done using the Hadoop distributed file system, HDFS, Sometimes combining this with data storage systems such as HBase or Hive, Hadoop Common, which provides the tools needed for the user's computer systems, um, Sun OS, Debian, FreeBSD, et cetera, to read data stored under the Hadoop file system, and Yarn, yet another resource nego negotiator, which manages resources of the systems storing the data and running the analysis, as well as the MapReduce programming model. So it's primarily those uh, key components. Um, so I'll be focusing on HDFS and MapReduce in the next few slides. A MapReduce program is composed of a map procedure, which performs filtering and sorting, and a reduce method, which performs a summary operation. The MapReduce system, uh, which is also sometimes called an infrastructure or framework, orchestrates the processing by marshalling the distributed servers, running the various tasks in parallel, managing all the communications and data transfers between the various parts of the system, and providing for redundancy and fault tolerance. Data storage and processing in Hadoop. Within the HDFS layer, there is a name node and data nodes. The name node manages the file system, keeping the metadata for all the files and directories in the tree, while the data nodes store and retrieve the data blocks when they are told to by clients or the name node and report back to the name node periodically, which is called a heartbeat. Within the MapReduce layer, there is a job tracker and task trackers. The job tracker co coordinates the execution of the jobs and the task trackers uh, control the execution of the map and reduce tasks in the machines that are doing the processing. Hadoop can be used to support distributed fault tolerant data processing and storage for semi-structured and no SQL data. It can also be used to manage structured data, especially data in um, Parquet and ORC formats and can be integrated with database stores other than HDFS. HDFS is particularly useful for data lake applications, as well as for establishing text-oriented or rich media data warehouses. However, data warehousing for structured data is restricted in Hadoop due to the lack of record level indexing. So that's an important point. Fault tolerance in Hadoop. Despite faults and failures, Hadoop will guide jobs towards successful completion. Hadoop was established as a platform to support distributed computing, leveraging cheap commodity hardware from the beginning. Individual nodes and network components were assumed to experience high rates of fault and failure. As such, it was designed from the beginning to withstand those regular faults and failures within that hardware. The discussion will be broken down into fault tolerance features in the HDFS layer and the uh, MapReduce layer. So within HDFS, the detection of faults and rapid automatic recovery are key goals. Um, failures may occur in either the name node or those data nodes. If the name node does not receive the heartbeat signal from a data node for 10 minutes, um, and that can be changed if needed. It considers that data node to be dead or out of service. The name node then initiates replication of the data blocks that were hosted on that now dead node to be hosted on another node. There's only one name node per cluster. Prior to Hadoop 2.0, the name node was a single point of failure for an um, HDFS cluster. However, there is an option to have two redundant name nodes now in the same cluster using an active passive configuration with a hot standby. This also allows a gentle administration, administrator initiated failover for planned maintenance and servicing. 
Uh, so fault tolerance in MapReduce is a little bit different. Jobs can fail in MapReduce in different ways through the job tracker or through a task tracker failure or while running the task itself. If a task tracker stops sending a heartbeat signal to the job tracker, the job tracker will remove that task from the pool. To handle failures that occur while running a task, the task tracker marks a task attempt as failed and creates room for another task. The failed job can then be rerun. If the job tracker fails, it, you, um, it used to act as a single point of failure. However, one of the key goals of YARN uh, when YARN was introduced was to eliminate single points of failure in MapReduce. As of Hadoop 2.0.0, when YARN was introduced, there are no more single points of failure in MapReduce. MapReduce sits on top of YARN, which sits on top of HDFS. YARN includes a resource manager, node manager, and application master. In the event of a crash, the resource manager can be recovered from a saved state. The state consists of node managers in the systems and the running applications. So some more recent enhancements to fault tolerance in Hadoop. Before Hadoop 3.0.0, Hadoop handled faults through replica creation, which means that it created a replica of the user's data on different machines, those data nodes, in the HDFS cluster. So if a machine failed, there would be a copy of the data available, creating redundancy. The number of replicas created depended on the replication factor, which was three by default. For that default, two replicas would be created on different nodes in addition to the original, uh, in additional to the original, which would be three replicas in total. As of Hadoop 3.0, uh, two or more standby nodes are supported to provide additional fault tolerance, unlike Hadoop 2.0, which supported only two name nodes. This limited fault tolerance as HDFS could run only uh, one single standby and a single active name node. This limitation has been addressed in Hadoop 3.0 to enhance the fault tolerance in HDFS. In Hadoop 3.0.0, Erasure coding was introduced. This was a big improvement um, in this release. It improved storage effic efficiency while also providing the same level of fault tolerance as the traditional replication-based HDFS. It had much less uh, storage overhead. Essentially, um, RAID architectures use Erasure coding, which cuts the file into different units and stores it on various disks. For each strip, a certain number of parity cells are calculated and stored so that if any machine fails, the block can be recovered from that parity cell. This reduces the storage overhead by up to 50%, which is huge. Prior to the 3.3.0 release, information from a data, uh, dead data node in um, in the stream was stored locally. This meant that it could not be shared among the input streams of that same client in HDFS. To eliminate this impact from dead data nodes, a dead data node detector was designed, which detects that those dead nodes and shares this information among all the input streams in the same client. Therefore, when a dead node blocks that stream, dead node detection can find it and share this information to the other streams in the same DFS client. This means that the DFS streams will not bother reading from that dead node. And some other key enhancements in Hadoop uh, 3.0.0 and other three uh, releases are, are these ones here. Um, I'm hoping to dive into some of these a little bit more, particularly that uh, support for Azure encoding, the Yarn timeline service, um, the support for more than two name nodes, the default ports of multiple services having been changed, and the intra data node balancer are areas I'm hoping to dive into more. I just want to quickly discuss using Ambari with Hadoop. Apache Ambari is an open source management platform for provisioning, managing, and monitoring, as well as securing Apache Hadoop clusters. It, is, it used to be a sub-project of Hadoop, but it is now a top-level project. It has um, a wizard-driven interface, which can assist in the config configuration of fault-tolerant components. It can help protect HDFS data and metadata as it enables the configuration of HDFS snapshots for data protection and backup. So that's very important uh, when we're discussing fault tolerance. Ambari, um, Ambari allows a system administrator to manage and disable components of a particular service or cluster. And fault tolerance is enhanced by establishing primary and secondary components of different clusters in Ambari, providing redundancy in case a primary component fails or becomes unavailable. So we can see how um, Ambari can enhance fault tolerance with Hadoop. So fault tolerance and resilient systems, I did want to kind of do a little bit of contrasting and comparing uh, between these terms. Um, so resilience is based on the shifting relationship between scales and between autonomy on the one hand and connectivity on the other. I really like that description um, from this paper here, which is actually, uh, which was published in the Journal of Landscape Architecture. And I, I thought was just um, so well put. Um, so recently in Canada, we had um, our speech from the throne and the theme for that speech from the throne was build back better. 
and um, multiple times resiliency and the word resilient were mentioned and I pulled out a couple instances here in the slide. Um, so that's definitely a key for, for Canada moving forward, this whole concept of resilience. And I wanted to kind of dive a little bit into what are sort of the, the commonalities and differences between fault tolerance and resilience and how they really do fit together. So fault tolerance and resilience, um, I did uh, look at this, this seminal piece by Lorenzo, uh, Lorenzo Strigini on fault tolerance and resilience, meanings, measures, and assessment. Um, and I do pull out a couple passages from there because it, it was just um, very well put, I thought. The word resilience from, is from the Latin verb, um, meaning to jump back, which means literally the tendency or ability to spring back and thus the ability of a body to recover its normal size and shape after being pushed or pulled out of shape and therefore figuratively any ability to recover to normality after a disturbance. Engineering concepts that are related to resilience therefore include, for instance, fault tolerance, redundancy, stability, and feedback control. A review of uses of the word resilience by scientists identified uses in child psychology, psychiatry, ecology, business, and industrial safety. So there's certainly a more broad use of the term resilience than there is a fault tolerance. The 2007 RESIST document, for instance, concluded that a useful meaning to apply to resilience for current and future ICT is the ability to deliver, maintain, improve service when facing threats and evolutionary changes. So the important extension to emphasize in comparison with words like fault tolerance seems to be that disturbances um, need to be tolerated and that current and future systems also need to be able to tolerate change. So Lorenzo Stragini put it really well in that seminal piece, while existing practices of dependable design deal reasonably well with achieving and predicting dependability in ICT systems that are relatively close and unchanging, the tendency to making all kinds of ICT systems more interconnected, open, and able to change without new intervention by designers is making existing technologies inadequate to deliver the same levels of de dependability. For instance, evolution itself of the system and its uses impairs dependability. New components create system design faults or vulnerabilities by feature interaction or by triggering pre-existing bugs in existing components. Likewise, new patterns of use arise, new interconnections open the system to attack by new potential adversaries and so on. So I thought that was uh, really well put and really thought provoking. An important specialized use of the word resilience has emerged uh, within the engineering field. Um, so this term is resilience engineering and it is sort of a, a movement, a new sub-discipline. Um, and it, it looks at complex socio-technical systems. So within this sphere, the word resilience is meant to identify enhanced ability to deal with the unexpected or a more flexible approach to achieving safety than the current mainstream approaches. So there, there is a little bit of a problem, as Soleto in, um, points out in their article from 2016, uh, one of the current problems with systems engineering is that different stakeholders use the same word to mean different things and different words to mean the same thing. And that's really what we can see by examining some of the, uh, the published um, frameworks on resiliency. Uh, this slide just demonstrates all the different uh, ways systems are defined. I'm not going to go through these, but this just really illustrates uh, how complex these definitions and uses can get. Um, so when we're looking at resilience frameworks, I think I just have a couple minutes to zoom through these. Um, we do uh, we do see some interesting um, uh, pulling together of of fault tolerance and this idea of resilience and sort of how they compare and contrast and how those principles of fault tolerance really do fit into the principles of resilience. So in the common agricultural policy uh, framework, we can see that they talk about robustness here and then they add transformability and adaptability to that framework. And then they say resilience is more than robustness. So for me, I think that this idea of robustness that they're showing in this framework is sort of uh, similar to the idea of fault tolerance or is portraying fault tolerance within this framework. And then those ideas of transformability and adaptability are sort of conveying that idea of uh, resilience within the framework. So it's uh, it's more than robustness. 
Um, within the city resilience framework, which is a very commonly used uh, framework and was developed by Arab with support from the Rockefeller Center in 2015, uh, we see a lot of similarities as well. So for example, we see um, providing reliable communications and mobility. So that's certainly key to fault tolerance. We also see ensure continuity of critical services. Again, very key to fault tolerance. And we see these words ensure, ensure, um, which I, I, I would take to mean that these are sort of the sub parameters within this framework that are, are essentially those fault tolerance aspects and are meeting those uh, fault tolerance needs within the larger city resilience framework in this case. Uh, and if we looked at the World Health Organization's conceptual framework for resilience, we see something similar as well. So we see this idea of decreased vulnerability, which we could also think of as perhaps increased reliability and availability. Um, and we also see this idea of recovering to pre-state, uh, pre-event states and recovering but worse than before, which I think would really capture that idea of fault tolerance within the system. And then these ideas of transform and recover better than before would capture those ideas of resilience all within the same sort of framework. So we do see that these resilience frameworks are acknowledging the importance of fault tolerance. And I won't go through this one, but uh, but we can see that again, and we see a lot of similarities. We see those words recovery, redundancy, robustness. So again, we're seeing those common features of fault tolerance within this resilience framework for urban climate resilience. And this was a very interesting one because um, within this conceptual framework for the resilience of systems, um, which was actually put together by the OECD, uh, we see all of these principles of resilience laid out here. And in fact, if we go through these principles, all of these principles are common between the ideas of resilience and fault tolerance. Um, so preparedness, learning and innovation, thresholds, responsiveness, diversity and redundancy, connectivity, self-organization, inclusion, social cohesion. These in one way or another could also be um, keys and, and seen as principles of fault tolerance. So it's very interesting to see essentially the, the connectedness between these ideas of resilience and fault tolerance within these published frameworks. So the key takeaways for today are that fault tolerant design enhances availability and reliability in all systems. Stakeholders often use different terms to discuss the same thing. For example, fault tolerance is used and defined in reputable computer science and engineering literature. However, other terms may be used to discuss or include fault tolerance in other disciplines. Software-based fault tolerance is key to fault tolerant computing systems, which can affect many other systems. Postgres, SQL, and Hadoop are free and open source tools, which can be used to enhance software-based fault tolerance in data management. The inclusion of fault tolerant design principles and conceptual frameworks of resilient systems from multiple fields supports the recognized importance of fault tolerance across systems and sectors. Although resilience is a slightly different, broader concept than fault tolerance, fault tolerance is a key part of resilient systems. Postgres, SQL, and Hadoop can be used as part of a resilient system design. Uh, special thanks go to Dr. Wei Chu Chung who is a committer to Apache Hadoop, HEFS, and Submarine. Um, he gave a lot of input on the uh, Hadoop slides and the enhancements in the 3.x releases. So I really appreciate that, as well as to Jonathan Katz, who is a committer to the Postgres SQL project and gave me a lot of guidance on fault tolerance in Postgres SQL, especially uh, the new features in Postgres SQL 13. And to Cola Loven, who's an advocate of Inkscape and open broadcaster software, and who helped me design the introduction graphic. Thank you.